we are delighted to be uh, invited to share with you, I think, some ideas around what we um, are doing and think could be done around improving quality of care in healthcare facilities. So maybe to stress that our work is largely around strengthening healthcare facilities within the health system and uh, that it's important, we think, to have a renewed focus on quality improvement. Um, so our thinking uh, broadly goes along the lines uh, of this slide. So I think it's important to try and actually uh, capture what is quality, what it is not, and I will say a little bit about that and how we can do that. Uh, our methodology, and I think the one for which there is most evidence out there at the moment, uh, is standards-based audit or maternal death audit or perinatal death audit. So basically the word audit. Now there are um, areas where the word audit uh, rings alarm bells because it's associated with financial audit and stuff. Uh, so some people prefer to use the term review for the point the point of view of this presentation, I have just used audits, but we see it more as a review than a sort of critical inspection. Um, there is a relationship between uh, good data and use of good data for maternal newborn health and measuring quality, and I'd like to say something about that. And uh, finally, uh, is it possible to actually measure that this whole input uh, quality improvement is at all effective with regard to uh, health outcomes, for example? Um, so to start with some thinking around uh, quality of care, uh, I rather like this first quote which uh, seems to indicate that uh, we're not very civilised if we don't have quality of care. Um, and I picked it from the literature in as early as 1933 which puts I think us to shame a little bit as uh, you know the thoughts around looking at quality are uh, in the last decade or so um, is coming back in the health system but really uh, people have been thinking about it for quite a while. And the second um, quote, if you like, from Mahmoud Fatala has always been very important to us that there has been a time, I think, when we wholly focused on, you know, getting access or improving demand, getting women to access care uh, and thinking about, you know, why they weren't accessing care or type 3 delays or, or type 1 and or 2 delays, for example. Uh, but I think we need to think differently as well and think, you know, what can we do at healthcare facility level that will make sure that these women come because most women um, are quite uh, aware I think of what the services are in the environment in which they live and um, this is called this picture is called women are thinking by a Zimbabwean artist and I think this is very true and I think we know that um, quality of care at healthcare facility level is very closely linked to coverage so uh, although there has been limited research in this area it's clear that if the quality of care is poor then women and their families are much less likely to access this care so there is a direct link. Um, we actually some time ago did a systematic review to try and work out how you could define quality of care especially for maternal and newborn health which obviously has got different uh, aspects to it, different um, dimensions, because it's not just quality for the mother, but it's also quality for the baby or the fetus. And uh, I think we have found this definition, uh, which is certainly not ours, but uh, is a sort of generic definition out there, which captures the fact that quality of care can be quite complicated. Uh, it's both the individual and population. It's of course about timely and appropriate and safe treatment, and I would say a bit more about that later, uh, with the aim actually measurable aim of getting improved outcomes, which can be both, of course, uh, numerical health outcomes, uh, and I will say something about case fatality rates, or the perception or the experience of care, which is maybe more qualitative. Both are equally important, uh, we think. Um, but we need to think about, you know, what is the outcome of quality and are they linked? It needs to be uh, in line with evidence-based practice and of course in uh, reproductive health, maternal and newborn health, there is a right uh, aspect to this as well which we think is important. So actually uh, during birth the woman has a right to uh, safe uh, delivery and safe care. So this uh, definition actually gives us quite a lot to think about but helps us structure our approach I think also to quality. Uh, finding examples of 
good quality of care can be unfortunately more challenging than finding examples of poor quality of care at the moment and it has not been too difficult for us to find a number of uh, pictorial uh, depictions of poor quality of care and uh, in fact some time ago we actually filmed uh, the process of care being given in a hospital in a country which will remain nameless uh, but it was so clearly substandard care that it was actually difficult to be allowed to um, show this um, document in, in, in different settings. Uh, for us, I think it's the ultimate outcome that we are also concerned about. So given that, um, and this is some data that we have collected uh, through the Making It Happen program, given that the baseline case fatality rates for mothers, so the percentage chance of dying if you have an uh, emergency obstetric care need, is still around 2%. Um, that is rather high, I would say, and a stillbirth rates of around 3.5 or 3 percent are also uh, rather too high and we really seriously need to think about how improving the quality, uh, which means making care more effective, can result in a reduction in these, um, uh, I would say, quite um, appalling statistics. Uh, I know we have made progress and I would not uh, I am very enthusiastic about that and I'm very pleased that we all together have managed to reduce maternal mortality ratios across the globe uh, in a large number of countries and that is fantastic. But a renewed focus on quality is needed, I think, to get these down or to reduce these levels further. So what sort of methodology or tools do we have in maternal newborn health for improving the quality of care? I think actually we're very lucky because we have a tradition in maternal newborn health uh, or in obstetrics and gynaecology of looking at quality of care as we do in family planning. Uh, and one of the uh, leading examples of that is maternal death audit or review. Uh, and uh, Charles is going to talk to us about how maternal death audit can be catalyzed in a, in a country at district level, but how it's then brought together to national level to, to make the numbers actually speak uh, and, and to indicate where there is perhaps substandard of care that needs to be improved. So this, this maternal death audit uh, tool, if you like, is uh, quite popularly accepted across certainly uh, most of Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia and is something I think that we should uh, work on um, going forward. Then of course you similarly have what is called perinatal death audits which is for neonatal deaths, early neonatal deaths and stillbirths. That is much less frequently practiced but I'll say a little bit about that. And then there is a sort of standards based audit sometimes called clinical audit or criterion based audit but I think the correct term is probably standards based audit. Uh, which is um, less depressing, if you like, because you don't need to have a death uh, in the hospital to be able to do this. And it's a very well um, uh, appreciated method of improving quality of care, and I will say a little bit more about that too. Um, so all these three are used in combination in maternal newborn health, and um, there is actually quite good evidence to show that these, this is a good methodology for improving uh, the quality of care. Uh, so you might ask how does maternal death audit, perinatal death audit and standards based audit, how do these link up? And um, I think that is not immediately obvious to healthcare providers in the field as well, but we would use death audits as, an, uh, as a way of identifying specific areas of care where there is, if you like, the most example of substandard care and for that area of care we would then look at developing standards or working with standards to introduce standards based audits. So I'm going to hand over to Charles to first talk about the maternal death audit methodology and give an example of how we have used that in Kenya or how we are working with our Kenyan colleagues to implement that. Yes, thank you Ninka. So um, it's a pleasure to be here and to speak to you about um, our experience with um, strengthening quality of care for um, maternal and newborn health in Kenya. Um, I'm going to give a broad overview and then I'm going to speak specifically about um, setting up confidential inquiries into maternal deaths in Kenya. Um, Kenya, as you know, is um, one of the um, 
a thriving economy in East Africa. Um, the economy is developing so fast and um, also the need for better quality of care, you know, the accountability systems are also um, coming into the spotlight. But Kenya still has an unacceptable high maternal mortality ratio, um, 400 um, and above uh, maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. A more recent um, uh, nationwide survey conducted by the Center for Population Studies at the University of Nairobi, um, after the devolution of um, the government, uh, initially the government was um, uh, more central with just eight um, regions, and more recently it's been broken down into 14 different counties with now um, different um, departments of health at county level with a lot of power. So they had to understand um, what the contribution of each county was to maternal deaths. And the findings were quite interesting. You know, huge di disparities in access and quality of care and health outcomes. So for example, you have 10 counties um, in the country contributing to 95% of maternal mortality ratio. Um, and you have a wide range of from above 600 maternal deaths to almost 4,000 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. So uh, this shows you the disparities in access and the quality of care um, for, um, uh, you know, for women and newborns. In Kenya, they have about um, 6,000 maternal deaths annually, and over, just slightly over 84,000 beds occur at healthcare facility level. There's been a good re um, recognition and realization that we've not made good progress in um, maternal health since 2010. Um, from the first um, version of the Global Strategy for Women and Children's Health published by the UN Secretary General, um, it was clear even at 2010 that continuing at that pace, we will not meet the MDGs. Um, 2015 has come, the situation has not really changed for a lot of the countries that carry the greatest burden of maternal deaths. Right from 2010, you know, there was a focus on um, using better quality information to produce results. If we don't know exactly why women are dying and what the contributing factors to death is, we will not have context-specific solutions to improving maternal health. We have the evidence of what works, but how to put it into practice in each local setting becomes um, the challenge. And so one of the key things that was recommended, which was re-echoed in the um, renewed UN Secretary General's um, um, strategy for women, children, and adolescents' health, is about improving vital registration, which will uh, allow us to be able to count you know, um, women that have died, but also not just counting, knowing exactly what are the causes of maternal deaths, what are the contributing factors of maternal deaths. And so um, the... Maternal death surveillance and review system was introduced um, in 2012. Now, so this is, um, this is a sort of modification of the maternal, traditional maternal death audits as we knew it for many years, uh, or maternal death reviews. Now, uh, I mean, I'll talk a bit about more about this um, new terminology, which has, you know, um, uh, you know, quite dramatically l l lost the word review or audit. It's now maternal death surveillance and response. Um, but then the principles still remain the same. I think that was brought in because it was realized that we may be conducting maternal death reviews at healthcare facility level. It needs to, the results need to be used to improve quality of care and the health system at that level. Level, but also there needs to be a national response which is which which this feeds into but this was not happening in most of the countries so a lot of the um, authors and literature quite recognize that um, improving quality of care you know requires good functional maternal death surveillance and um, response systems now, if you look at the more recent um, um, document and um, produced uh, strategies towards ending preventable maternal mortality, um, if you look at the cross-cutting team, um, cross-cutting team looks at um, being able to count numbers, um, numbers of maternal death, being able to, to, to know exactly what causes this death and what the contributing factors are. But then if you look at the um, five key strategies, addressing inequalities, um, addressing all causes of maternal deaths, you must know what they are to be able to address the causes, and then the issue of accountability. MDSR provides an opportunity to be able to realize these um, key strategies. 
Um, now, this slide will have worked um, better if it was in PowerPoint, but I'll do my best um, to go through it. Um, I, I was hoping I wouldn't have everything up there at once, but if you just focus on the um, sort of three-dimensional diagram with arrows, which I have up there, um, the way the WHO has um, prescribed for maternal death um, um, surveillance and response systems to be gradually put in place in countries and scaled up is working at, um, we can say, uh, three dimensions. One is based on the plate w places where deaths are identified. So broadly speaking, we can say, well, a woman will die in a healthcare facility or outside the healthcare facility. So anything outside the healthcare facility, let's call it community. The other one is looking at scale of coverage, you know, um, so geographical areas, urban, rural, you know, districts, regions, um, the entire country. And then now in really improving the quality of these reviews will be now going towards um, what you have in the diagonal arrow there, the um, confidential inquiry into maternal deaths. And with this framework, you see that, um, you know, you start small and then you expand until you, um, you carry out a very comprehensive process and clearly um, by definition, this takes time. So far back in 2003, the WHO started promoting maternal death reviews and uh, audits, and they had um, regional workshops in Africa and in Asia. And um, by 2004, Kenya, um, through the Ministry of Health, um, put forward a government secular that made maternal deaths um, notifiable. Um, it was a very strong secular that had prescriptions of um, you know, repercussions for not um, reporting maternal deaths or, you know, using the tools to, to you know, to report maternal deaths. So the tools were uh, maternal death notification forms and maternal death review forms. So the process was within 48 hours of a maternal death, the notification form should be complete and sent to the provincial office and then to the National uh, Ministry of Health. And the maternal death reviews should be completed within two weeks and all the paperwork submitted centrally. Um, so this went on from 2004 till 2006. Then the Ministry of Health invited the center to come and review the process. So we conducted this review in 2007, and the key findings were that there was gross under-reporting. Um, it was clear from the tools that um, the causes of maternal deaths were not uniformly defined or reported. So basically, uh, collating all this information would be meaningless, because what healthcare worker in one facility believes to be the cause of maternal death, um, based on everything we have found in the notes is different from once what somebody else in the other facility. So making it difficult to come up with any central action. Um, we also, so in addition to gross under-reporting, we found out gross under-reporting by com uh, comparing the deaths um, reported through the routine HMIS system, um, which was, I mean, grossly incomplete um, by all accounts, to what was reported through the system. And there was a huge disparity. And so in 2009, um, the, the government reviewed the guidelines again and the tools and all of that. Um, and um, the process went on for a few more years. And then we were asked to do another review in 2011. Well, not much had changed, so still the same problems. In healthcare facilities, there was no clear leadership, no quality improvement committees, um, nobody driving the process, and healthcare uh, workers still did not know how to um, correctly assign um, causes of maternal deaths. By 2012, um, through um, DFID funding, um, Making It Happen was funded to work in three of the eight regions in Kenya, um, covering 15 counties. And in those counties, um, one of the first things we did was to start implementing some of these recommendations. Now that we were backed with, um, you know, we, we knew what to do, and now we had the resources. So we put in place um, quality improvement committees in all of these healthcare facilities in these um, regions, and also trained them on how to conduct um, maternal death reviews. And each healthcare facility had a designated lead. So this is at healthcare facility level, and mainly the focus was on the public healthcare facilities. Um, and well, a few high volume mission hospitals, you know, based on discussion with the Ministry of Health. 
by um, 2014, um, the Ministry of Health um, carried another key event in 2012 was the introduction of MDSR, so the surveillance bit of it, which um, uh, reporting maternal deaths was reporting maternal deaths um, was linked to um, the infectious disease surveillance system, so um, IDS2 um, system, so that um, for every maternal death it had to be um, notified electronically from site and also all reviews completed needed to be um, put online and uploaded to a central system. When we looked at the amount of information coming through that system compared to what was coming through the HMIS, um, the situation was even worse than what was achieved using the paper-based approach. Um, so there was, there's, a pro, there's a process um, um, problem there. Yeah, okay. Um, we also found out that in healthcare facilities that were supported by um, donor-funded projects that were closely monitored and supported, you know, they were able to report a bit more than you know, other healthcare facilities. So that means that the system was largely dependent on you know, um, external support. Um, Ministry of Health, as usual, again uh, commissioned another review in 2015 of the entire process, and then that's still going on. But then this brings us to uh, you know, one of the big problems which has occurred in Kenya so far, inability to um, have a, an effective national response um, using good quality data that comes from maternal death reviews. And so what we needed to do was to support um, centrally to improve the coordination um, uh, and the use of this type of information. And so from 2015, we started working on the diagonal approach there, um, instituting a confidential inquiry system. So I'll talk more about that um, in the next um, slides. Um, so we there is clearly a need to have accurate information of maternal deaths. There's clearly a need that to, in order to sustain this, we need to involve the healthcare professionals, the Ministry of Health, um, to be able to drive this change. And we have a lot of experience of this happening um, in similar economies, similar countries. You know, South Africa, Malaysia have done a very good job um, in this regard. So clearly, the program, the problems where central level coordination um, was quite poor. The structures were not in place, and um, you know we. At this point in time we were in Kenya, there was good political will and um, DFID provided that funding for us to be able to work. So we use a coordinated approach, working with the Ministry of Health, members of the UN family. Um, this was time consuming but very worthwhile. Also working with the professional um, associations, the nurses, the obstetricians, and also you know, the main referral hospitals in the country that see most of the maternal deaths. Um, to be able to sell the idea that we needed to have proper reviews, we needed the central committee to work on this and produce results in a timely manner, produce reports and recommendations. And so through a um, long uh, consultation process in um, October 2014, we had the sign-off of um, national terms of reference for a committee, how to select national assessors, and then this was followed swiftly by sensitization of healthcare workers, county um, department of health um, around the country. All this was to make sure that we had good buy-in and support. The next step was establishment of a national secretariat for maternal debt um, um, reviews and surveillance housed within the Ministry of Health. Um, this was quite key. The Director of Medical Services was quite enthusiastic about this, Director of uh, Family uh, Health Services. They allocated the resources, the physical space to house the secretariat. Um, we also worked with um, the um, National Perinatal Epidemiology Unit um, in the UK that um, you know, conducts the um, confidential inquiries into maternal deaths in the UK, the best experience in the world for over 50 years you know, to help us build capacity of the new secretariat formed in the Ministry of Health. Um, so this secretariat has been furnished with computers and appropriate software which I'll talk about shortly and also the secretariat is um, tasked with conduct with um, organizing review meetings to review centrally all the maternal deaths in the country and producing um, a report. So one of the key uh, milestones in getting this started was um, you know, um, 
developing an electronic um, audit system. So this is um, developed from very successful um, software that has been used in South Africa in the past 10 years. The um, South African MAMAS, um, so this is a um, maternal um, mortality audit system. It's an electronic tool that can store information, uh, rapidly aggregate information, and produce um, uh, reports in a timely manner. This tool has been adapted for use also in um, Malawi. So under this, under our program, you know, we have um, developed this together with um, the Ministry of Health, and it has just a screenshot. The you know um, demographics, um, initial diagnosis as we compare with the final diagnosis of the reviewers. On the line, cost of death as defined based on the ICD-10 mm contributory factors, associated factors, and all of that. And then you know you can run um, you know filters and uh, different types of um, analysis rapidly exported. You can export to Excel and make graphs and all of that. And then the narratives are built from this. So just to summarize. Um, the outputs, uh, the process and the outputs. So, it, I mean, it takes a long time getting advocacy and buying at um, country level, at county level and national level. And then development of the MAMAs um, followed them um, uh, swiftly. Um, identification and training of assessors, setting up of the sec secretariat um, were, were the next milestones. Then um, getting the case notes from all the hospitals. We had done a sensitization to hospitals, but then there is still suspicion on what this process is all about. So, I mean, the secretariat has dedicated staff to continue working with the Ministry of Health, get the right letters, introductions, talk with um, county health executives, executives of hospitals to release these case notes. So, um, we hope that at the end of the first year, we have um, 40 trained assessors, a minimum of four review meetings per year. We will have reviewed um, a minimum of 780 maternal deaths. And in the first year, all the main referral hospitals managing obstetric complications will be involved. By 15 months from the start of the project, the first interim report will have been produced with um, recommendations, and this will be a milestone for the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, probably only next to what South Africa has achieved. So some of the key lessons in this process. Advocacy takes a long time, and it is a worthwhile investment, because without the buy-in and the support of the professional associations who have to own it, because this is a key ingredient in the success we've seen from other countries, including uh, middle and low-income countries who've succeeded in this way, and then good buy-in from the Ministry of Health. Essential for progress is that national ownership and political will. We had it quite easy, because there was a, move, there was a big, good political um, will you know, from, uh, from the Ministry of Health. We think that the surveillance system needs to be, we need to re rethink it to make it more innovative and effective. At the moment, um, it is not, um, in my opinion, it needs to be retaught. Uh, I hope the revised guidelines in Kenya, uh, which we have contributed to, will be able to address this. We think that what we've achieved in Kenya has been quite catalytic in several ways. It has increased the ownership of the process at healthcare facility level. You know, just to take away the fear factor that this is all about saving women's lives and improving the quality of care rather than punitive measures. It has increased their capacity to uh, keep proper records and the filing systems in some of these hospitals as they've been challenged to be able to produce you know, good documents and file uh, of um, maternal deaths. It has also increased the um, capacity of the Ministry of Health to manage the confidential inquiry um, process and utilize out output, and has the strong potential to increase accountability um, uh, by the Ministry of Health, um, and they will be held accountable by civil society and communities, who will be part of the recommendation process after um, these central reviews are complete. So thanks for listening. Um, I think um, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the case study we've just had in um, Kenya, and I'll be happy to take questions when we come to that um, stage. I'll just pass it on back to Ninka now, if I can find. I think this is your slide, Ninka. Sorry for taking so much time <laughs> explain. Yes. But, uh, I need to explain. Oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, but thank you very much, Charles. I think we thought it was useful to have a sort of real life experience of how this theoretical framework of improving quality, you know, actually works in a country and what are the ingredients uh, to success. And um, I think certainly in sub-Saharan Africa and in many countries in Southeast Asia where maternal, where there are still too many women dying, well, any woman's death is one too many, I know, but in these high, uh, high impact countries, 
the process of maternal death audit and now maternal death surveillance and response is well accepted and I think it's only on the back of that that you can introduce something like standards based audits in a very positive way um, and that means that we then have to say okay what are standards really because it's all very well from the West coming and saying you know here are some standards you need to implement uh, but that's not uh, quite the way in which uh, we have experienced it working or it doesn't work that way basically um, so uh, we also have to be sure that the standards that people are going to be using are linked to evidence because uh, in many of these settings people have had um, limited opportunity to take note of the recent developments in in maternal care in obstetrics uh, you know what is evidence based care and what is not evidence based care and which practices should be taken on and which should be actually abolished. So in many settings where we work we have very senior colleagues who have been trained a very long time ago and have very traditionalist uh, views of obstetrics and of course you know standards need to be up to date and in line with the current evidence. Uh, and we have found that um, when we develop standards it's very good to have a very clear objective what is it we're trying to achieve and then sit down and discuss with healthcare providers what is the structure what do you need for this standard what is the process what do you have to do and why are we doing it what is the expected outcome uh, the second thing that uh, needs reinforcing is that a clinical audit or standards based audit is not a one off exercise it is a continuous quality improvement cycle in quality improvement terms so often we would meet colleagues who said yes we have done uh, you know an audit and that means they've done a one time measurement as most of our women don't like coming to us because whatever the beds are too high that's not actually clinical audit, that you, that's your first measurement and after that you sit down and you say well if that's such a factor what can we do, can we get different beds, what should we do, should we deliver on the floor, mm, what, sh what can we do about this. You implement the change and then you reevaluate your uh, status, you know how many women are now happy coming to this facility. That is clinical audit, it's a continuous cycle and that is not yet I would say understood by um, everyone and it's only when you have this circle going on that you will improve the quality, not just a single measurement. Uh, so to share some thoughts about developing standards, um, remember that this is a foreign concept still to many people. Uh, we do not want it to be an inspection exercise uh, and so developing these you know clear objective and criteria is is really important so you know what are you trying to achieve and then what do you need uh, what do you need to do and what do you expect the outcome to be and it's very interesting then whenever we sit with healthcare providers to discuss this uh, if it's very new the first thing people will say is oh we can't possibly do that because we need money and we don't have a theater and we don't have the structure uh, but we need to go beyond that because actually there's a lot of uh, quality that can be improved without ad additional funding and without you know having the structure uh, necessarily in place. So these discussions are very valuable to make people think about how you can already set standards for care within the resources that you already have. Now let me clarify I'm not arguing for less resources going into maternal newborn health but I am saying that these should not be the primary limiting factor for getting started on quality improvement. I hope that makes sense. Uh, and so when you're developing these standards, as we said, it's really important they're evidence-based and I can think of an example. In many countries, women are still um, routinely given an enema, routinely given an episiotomy for the first... These are no longer evidence-based standards of care. Um, but it's all very well me coming as a professor in obstetrics and gynecology telling people what to do, that's not the point. The point is people need to examine the current evidence and agree that it's not really needed to give everyone an episiotomy during labour. So it's really a working together and sharing expertise. Um, standards need to be desirable and locally relevant. Um, it's really, really, really important that all professional groups, including at higher professional association level, are involved in developing these standards because they will set the tone. The nursing and midwifery councils will tell their midwives what to do and what not to do. So it's not really uh, very productive ignoring them at the start. And as Charles said, that can take time, but it is the ingredient of success ultimately. 
standards, of course, need to be smart. And um, I think the most important lesson we have learned and, and we have published about is that these standards actually should probably be locally developed and then they will be locally owned. Uh, so a little bit like it's all very well, the College of Obstetrician Gynecologists says, you know, cesarean section should be done within one hour of you know, deciding this is obstructed labor. If that is not a standard that's locally relevant or locally owned and locally formulated, uh, it's really very difficult to get people enthusiastic about auditing their standards. So this is simply an example of how we work with healthcare providers to really set out the standards uh, and criteria. <clears throat> this is an example which I just mentioned about uh, you know, a very enthusiastic group in a very large hospital in Kenya saying, of course we can do a cesarean section within one hour of deciding this needs to be done. Okay, what does it really mean when we say that? Uh, and Kenya is a very good example, again, not uh, because we're picking on Kenya today, but uh, some many years ago already, Kenya sat with all the professional associations and developed national standards themselves for these key areas of care. And uh, I hope it's obvious to you that obviously uh, these are not just clinical standards about you know, what you do in the PPH, but they can be general standards about you know, how do you treat a woman with dignity and respect, what does that mean? And uh, definitely there are also management and administrative related standards uh, to be developed and part of this. So once you have these standards, which are the basis of standards-based audits, what then is audit? So I think um, we've talked a little bit about the fact that uh, it can be around diagnosis and treatment, management, administration, approach, human rights, all of these can be captured in standards and that it's a very much a cycle that needs to be repeated. So this just goes to illustrate that again, I think. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, again, may take time, but very much the ingredient of success. Lots of discussion and debate, and it's only through this discussion and debate that people are really going to own the, the process, going to own the standard, going to understand what is evidence-based care. It's uh, also a very successful approach, and here is maybe an example of um, uh, an audit that was done, a process. Um, so the standard here are two on the left hand side. One is that uh, the agreement that was every woman with obstructed labour should be delivered within one hour of the diagnosis. Again this was a large hospital, did a lot of cesarean sections, a lot of cases of obstructed labour, many of them referred and they had realised realized that they were having quite a lot of maternal deaths resulting after complications of obstructed labour. Uh, most babies were stillborn by the time the cesarean section had been done and they were actually quite upset by this and wanted to improve it. So they measured the time it took them uh, from diagnosis, point of diagnosis, to actually uh, what they call a knife to skin. Uh, and it was up to six hours and they were appalled by this and it's only because they themselves tried to measure that they understood this and then they put in place a lot of uh, very simple solutions, anaesthetists to be available, lunch to be available in theatre, emergency sections jump the queue for the theatre, the lift should be repaired, hmm. right, things like that, practical solutions they could make and after three to four months the time had come down and the longest time anyone had to wait was two hours. So that's a very good example of you know how um, catalytic this process can be to make change. Uh, broad spectrum antibiotics always available and accessible. I actually worked with this particular group of healthcare providers. I thought that was automatically the case, uh, but it wasn't. Seven, only in 70% of cases was an antibiotic available to use. Uh, so again that can be changed with sort of good evaluation of care. And it's not just at big tertiary hospitals, this is important, can be done and very successful, but also at much lower uh, health care levels in much more rural settings. So here's an example from Malawi. Um, let's say we take the second one, which is ambulances need to be available at all times to transport patients who need referral. This is about connecting up healthcare facilities, getting them to work as a hub, and the fact that you know this is often not the case. So each and every standard can be formulated locally, can be measured, is a smart one and change is possible within three to four months of getting this started. Um, so you might say, well, that's a very uh, noble, idealistic, and, uh, but is it actually feasible? And Charles mentioned something about quality improvement committees being a sort of you know, group of people in healthcare facilities and 
in most settings nothing happens except by consensus. So quality improvement uh, committees or, or groups, whatever they are called in the setting, are really important. And again, as part of our baseline assessment of uh, over a thousand or so healthcare facilities in multiple countries, um, at least half uh, healthcare facilities of a medium size level have a quality improvement committee. And actually they are just waiting for some catalytic action to get going. And the last graph shows that um, I think they get a bit bad press sometimes to say, well, it's all very well, but they never take any action. Actually, if you document it, in many cases, they do take action. You know, 80% of uh, uh, comprehensive emergency obstetric care facilities took action uh, after they had their committee meetings. And I think that is amazing. And I think we need to sort of, you know, uh, work with them to, to get this up to, if you like, 100% uh, rather than giving them just a bit bad press. So I suppose our approach is catalytic and uh, we appreciate there is a lack of knowledge and skills and uh, a lack of, you know, even someone being interested in helping them to, to work with this way. And for that purpose, we have developed a quality improvement workshop package, which sort of broadly looks like this and can be developed in modules. And uh, we've got a very practical self learning manual type um, uh, knowledge material for people to share and lots of case scenarios to work on in groups. Uh, pull that together and that's being delivered. One of the key ingredients of successful audit is taking action. So there has been a large Cochrane review which has been recently updated on does audit work or not and if it works how does it work and it's all about having champions or a group of champions uh, taking this forward and making sure that whatever is discussed results in whatever action so we really help people make a very practical work plan you'd be surprised at how few people are able to draw up a work plan in these settings. I mean, I have been taught by my predecessors, but if I hadn't been taught, I wouldn't know how to work a work plan. So this, these are very practical tools that people um, still have a need for, I think. So overall, uh, there is good evidence for audit, and uh, the Cochrane reviews would suggest that this is, shows a greater impact on healthcare practices and outcomes than other improvement strategies, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that uh, perhaps um, afterwards. Just a few final slides to show that audit and data are very much uh, interlinked and one, if you like, stimulates the other. So uh, some people have said to me, you can't really do audit in these settings, you don't have accurate data. I would counteract that by saying, no, you use audit to illustrate that you need better data and the two go hand in hand. Uh, and I very much like this quote to say that, well, you know, if you get people to record data, then hopefully you also get them to think about the data and analyze the data and that's sort of all part of the evaluation of care and practice. And of course, there are many examples, this happens to be from Sri Lanka, where people are actually very good at uh, tallying up their monthly deliveries in, in the labor ward and so on and so forth. There are also very many examples of where this is not the case, but where this is the case, then the next step is for them to actually use this data. And again, audit is a really good method to get people to use the data they're already collecting, already have to collect, but to really think about the data. So it's all about measuring and um, before I get asked this, it's not just quantitative data, I know I showed, showed graphs, but it's also, you know, uh, information from the patients, uh, maybe focus group discussions or key informed interviews as to what they think and what their experience of care is. It's much more difficult to put in a graph, but there are other ways of depicting that. Uh, so I think this is actually my last uh, slide and maybe to try and summarize our thinking around this and I appreciate this is very much a, a thinking uh, presentation rather than, uh, you know, sharp cut examples of success. Um, it's all about trying to get people to find solutions rather than the problems. I would argue that in maternal newborn health we have for quite a long time looked at barriers to care and problems with accessing care and so on and if we can have a little bit of a focus to, okay, solutions, come up with a solution. Most people can actually come up with a solution and it's much more motivating to do so. Not ignoring the problems but uh, looking forwards. 
Uh, it's very much something that you need to do as a teamwork approach, uh, this quality improvement. I have not worked in any healthcare facility where it's possible for one single, no matter how good leader or how important a professor to make change, you need to do this as a group. Uh, leadership is very important and um, there are good leaders we find everywhere who are delighted to, to, to have us catalyze with them a group activity around this. Um, as a research organization, I think it's important to look at the evaluation of effectiveness of audits as a quality improvement method. I would say that there is insufficient, uh, robust evidence to be able to put this firmly on the international agenda and that is what people will be calling for. And there are ways of measuring, there are new indicators uh, which we have contributed to, uh, brought out by WHO, which would be translatable into standards. So there are methods of doing this which we would be interested to discuss more. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I'm sure it took a bit longer than we thought it should take. Uh, apologies, uh, but we're very happy to take uh, lots of questions and debates. Thank you.